It has to do with our Jewish friends, um, and it has to do with also with what you spoke of this morning. Uh, the chosen people, the Jews are the chosen people. You said earlier this morning, God made a covenant with himself for Abraham to bless his nations. So it's hard for me to just fathom all Jews is heaven and hell. All Jews are going to go to hell. So that's my first question, if I'm correct in that assessment. Second question is, when we have our, a conversation with our Jewish friends, especially now through Hanukkah and Christmas, sure. how do we turn the conversation to say, it's not enough. You have to go to Jesus, to our Messiah, to the mm -hmm. Son of God, so that you can go to heaven. What do you suggest we have a conversation Well, with? this is a great, great question, Salvador. Let me, let me answer it a couple of ways. First of all, not all Jews are going to hell. Okay. Uh, throughout human history, God has always had a remnant. That's Isaiah 6, that there is a remnant. There is the, it's the doctrine of the remnant. It's, 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 it's throughout the Old Testament. While the nation Israel was disobedient, the nation Israel was apostate, the nation Israel got involved with Baal and, and uh, idols, there was always a remnant of believing Jews. That is true now. Uh, in Christ, there is Jew and Gentile, then there's no distinction. We saw that in, in Galatians 3.28 this morning. So there has always been a believing remnant. There has always been, let's say, the seed of Eve, the, the, the believers in the true God, the, those who were God's people among the Jews. Paul says in Romans, not all Jews are Jews. By, by that he means not all those who are ethnic Jews are in the covenant, but there is a remnant. So throughout all of human history, God has retained a remnant of believing Jews. And that is true today, and it, it, there are many believing Jews, many around the world, and there have been for, for the whole of human history. So. But in order to be a part of that remnant, they had to believe in God. And when Christ came, they had to believe in Christ. Je Jesus basically said, believe in Me and you'll have life. You'll die in your sins if you believe not in Me, Gospel of John. So Jews who believe in Christ are in the kingdom, and there is a remnant, and it's a large remnant all over the world today. But the other aspect of this is there is a promise given that through that nation Israel, the nations of the world would be blessed. That's chapter 12 of Genesis, the first promise to Abraham, that through Abraham would come a seed through which salvation would come to the world. And that has come to pass. How? Because God used the Jews to be the people who received His divine revelation, this book. The whole Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the promises, the covenant, Paul says in Romans, all came through the Jews. So part of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise was that God would deliver the message of salvation through the Jewish people. There were Jews who believed it. And they were, from that group, chosen those who would receive the revelation and write it down. Even in the New Testament, the apostles are Jews, and they are chosen, along with those who were with them, to receive the New Testament. So God used the Jews to receive His Word, to write down His Word, and to give His Word to the world. So it is through the people that came out of Abraham's loins that the entire message of salvation has come to the whole world. And then there's a final aspect. There's a promise that God is going to save the nation Israel as, as, a, as a nation. Jeremiah 31 talks about the time when God will take out the stony heart and give them a heart of flesh, write His law in their hearts. That's the new covenant. That is yet to come. It's reiterated in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved because the promises of God have to be fulfilled. 
So we believe in the future salvation of Israel promised in the Old Testament, reiterated in Romans chapter 11. That is yet to come. There will be some rebels purged out, the prophets say, and then the nation Israel will be saved. What is remarkable about that is that there are still Israelites in the world because all the other people groups that were around the Jews have long since passed into the dustbin of history. There are no Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, Jebusites, or any otherites. But there are Israelites. God has preserved them until the end as a people to save them, as Romans chapter 11 says. Early in Acts, when Peter preaches, he actually says, even though you killed the Prince of Life and desired a murderer to be released unto you, Barabbas, you are the children of the covenant that God has made. God is preserving His nation. God is gathering His nation back with a future view to save them. And that is what I've been telling you about Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the confession that the Jewish nation will make one day in the future when they look on Christ and say He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. I think the best way to reach the Jews is to do what I did this morning, to show the promise starting in Genesis fulfilled through the fathers, through David, details by the prophets, and the answer is Christ, son of Abraham, son of David, virgin born. And He is the one who goes to the cross and fulfills every single detail of Isaiah 53. That's why when I was with Ben Shapiro, I took him through Isaiah 53. And I was pretty amazed because it went on for almost 20 minutes and he didn't even interrupt me, uh, which was really, uh, you know, that was very gracious of him. And somebody asked him, Did, were you offended by John doing that? And he said, no, for two reasons. I, I know he believed it with all his heart and I know he cared about my soul. Well, that is absolutely true. So I, I, think, I think the burden is with them to deny that Jesus is the fulfillment when He is born of a virgin, when He is fully God and fully man, when He fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies about being born in Bethlehem, um, all the details and at the cross, every detail from Isaiah 53 and even the resurrection and even the ascension. So what I encourage you to, to tell Jewish people is read Isaiah 53 and then read Matthew or Mark or Luke and see if Jesus isn't the fulfillment. The Scripture has the power. I don't think there's a kind of a way that, that you can do it better than the Word of God can do it. His Word is alive and powerful, okay? Thank you. And as you. always, great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it? Time's up? Oh. Do you guys have questions? Or? Mm -hmm. um, these, these are challenging times. I, I just want to say that in general. The, these, are, these are very, very challenging times. Um, th this, this country, this culture, this society we live in is disintegrating at every possible level. Um, you can get caught up in a lot of things, right? You, you, there's a lot of things that Christian people could be angry about. We don't like what they're doing to our country. We don't like that uh, they're normalizing transgender deviation and wanting to teach it in elementary school to our kids. This is a terrifying kind of thing. Uh, we, don't, we don't like that, that they're taking the Bible out of everything. We don't like it that there's a deep and growing resentment of Christianity. We don't like it that there's an advocacy of abortion in our culture that has completely taken over an entire political party. And murdering babies is the agenda and giving place to homosexual deviation, homosexual marriage and all other kinds of deviations, and we ask, how did these people ever get so much power? 
it's very easy to get caught up in all of that. It may kind of feel, if you know your history a little bit, like we're living in ancient Rome. If it's any encouragement to you, it's not new. It's not new. Our focus always has to be the same. We have to focus on honoring the Lord, living for the Lord, and proclaiming the gospel. And as I reminded some people in a visit some years ago to Washington to talk to some of the White House staff, we can't turn this group of people into the enemy. They're the mission field. Do you understand that? They are the mission field. We have to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why it is so ridiculous, and I've been saying this on Sunday morning, for Christians to be fighting each other. What is the point of that? That doesn't do anybody any good. The reason they're fighting each other is because they've lost sight of the real mission of the church. It's not to attack other Christians over racial or gender issues. It's to reach those who don't know Christ, right? This is where all our efforts and energies need to go. And you all have been very faithful in that. And, you know, we, we know the promise of Scripture, it's going to get worse and worse, right? Not going to get any better. You're not going to be able to make it better politically or sociologically. It is what it is. Evil men will grow worse and worse. Christianity will become more um, antithetical to the culture. It'll be more alien to the culture. It'll be more unacceptable to the culture. There will come down more laws against uh, the truth, against the gospel, against the Word of God over the next uh, how many years? That doesn't change anything. I just read this week that Bibles have been banned in China. Probably more Bibles right now are printed in China than anywhere in the world. And I asked a question of a publisher this week, what's the deal? And, and he said, you can print them there, you just have to export them. They want to make money on the Bible, but they don't want anybody to read it. So there is a growing hostility, but that doesn't change anything. The world is always hostile, right? They have, they have been polite, more polite in past years. That was a more polite world. They, they've always, the sinners have always hated the truth, but they've been more polite. They're not polite anymore. They, they want to they raise the stakes and they, they want to crush us and frighten us and push us into the background. But this is a time to be bold. This is a time for courage. I. I don't see a lot of that even among many Christian leaders who seem to be kind of caving in to the culture. But that's not surprising because for the last 25 years or so, they've been trying to accommodate the culture with basically a style of church that appeals to unbelievers. And now that they've sort of made an issue out of appealing to unbelievers, and it's time to take a stand against these things, they've painted themselves into a corner. So where is the courage of real conviction? It's not that you want to fight, it's that you have to proclaim the truth. You have to proclaim the truth. That's our mandate. Truthfully, these are the most exciting times of my life. I'm glad even at this age that I can be in the fight for the truth and be proclaiming it. These are times when people, as we heard earlier, are in deep despair. That's the best time to reach a sinner, right? When he or she is at the end of her resources. So preach Christ, live Christ, proclaim Christ, be a faithful witness. The Lord will lead you to the right people, okay?